I'll start with the integration landscape at Microsoft a couple of years ago when we started on this journey. What and why we decided to take this approach, what was the business drivers, what was the motivation for us to move to the cloud. We'll talk about the principles and the approach that we used in our decision to move forward and how we did the planning and migration. What was the strategy that we wanted to implement or approach this the right way to get us moving forward. And along the way, we have come significantly good one year now through the implementation process and where we are today, what are the challenges, what are the lessons learned, and of course, what are the freebies that we got, what are the lessons learned that become freebies for the rest of the folks. So that's pretty much the content for today's talk. And finally, we'll summarize as to where we are. So going back to the landscape at Microsoft, so we are, I would say, good 300, 400 million messages a month across the board on ES, on our application to application plus business to business integration. In this case, I'm focusing narrowly on just business to business. If you look at just business, we are at about 30 million plus messages a month. Across the board, we are approximately 4,000 integration streams today. We were at about 3,400 when we started. <clears throat> we have about 40 to 60 on-premise bus talk servers at a transactional volume that grows at about 30% year over year. About 600 plus external trading partners, 200 plus Microsoft systems that we integrate with. This is just the B2B side of the story. This is just what we integrate with external businesses and external applications for. Again, this is intended to show we are at a scale that the scale at which we operate is approximately the 95th percentile or the 99th percentile in terms of where we would be across the board, and certainly about 95th percentile or 99th percentile on just the B2B side as well, somewhere in the top. But that does not mean it is only for the top enterprises that the rest of the talk is applicable to. The rest of the talk is applicable across the board for everybody who has just one stream that they want to work with or one business process they want to put online or a small 10, 50, 100 business processes that they want to put across on cloud platform. The reason I say that is we have business units within Microsoft that are independently managed and independently operated that kind of resemble a VAT scenario where you deal with multiple small customers or each business unit pretty much resembles what a smaller or medium-sized business would be. So again, the integration streams that we would be talking about pretty much contain one external business or a partner sending a message of a certain type to one line of business application. The same partner might be sending multiple search business messages to multiple applications. Each of it is considered a separate stream. The example I would give is, let's take American Express as a uh, provider for corporate travel card or corporate travel services. The credit card transactions that they send through the internet to say, Conan from Microsoft used credit card to charge $10,000 for travel from Microsoft Redmond to Microsoft India. Okay, that's a transaction that came in from Seattle to Hyderabad, $10,000. That's one stream. The exact same company also has other messages that they send through for various other applications, let's say procurement systems or payment systems. When the payment is made, that's a completely different stream. So we have 4,000 plus streams as of today. And the intent that we wanted to get to, or the intent here was move all in to the cloud. Again, I don't need to preach the cloud benefits. You know all the benefits, elasticity, cost reduction. Back in 2010 when we started, our transactional cost was like significantly higher because our systems were built for resiliency and scale to operate at 400 million messages a month, 600 million messages a month. On average, 600 transactions a second is what we had our systems configured for. But that's the peak volumes that we hit. On an average day, we wouldn't hit that kind of volume. Average, five to 10% utilization is all we had on our systems across the board. Then we started the consolidation path. By the time we were in about 2011, 2012 time frame, 
we had already consolidated to some centralized bus architectures within Microsoft, realized the cost savings out of that. Still, it was nowhere near the 75% utilization that we wanted to target. We were at 15, 20. The cloud gave us all those benefits and we didn't have to do any of these design for scale. We didn't have to do any of the resiliency. We didn't have to worry about hardware procurement, managing the machines or CapEx versus OpEx. So quite a few benefits that we had and the intent was for us to get going as fast as we can. The first principle that we wanted to use was configure, not code. Previously we were writing code for everything. If I wanted to get something that is a distributed system, it needed miles and miles of pages of code that we had to write and put onto boxes and boxes across the world. Now, I don't need to do anything, it's all configuration, not code. If there is something that is a deficiency in the maps as Microsoft Azure Bistock services as a platform, we did not fill it right away. We actually worked with the product group and gave them the requirements to say, here is what the integration experiences for an enterprise. That is not optimal. 90% of our customers will need it. We call this the horse scenario versus unicorn scenario. Unicorn scenario being very specifically needed only for Microsoft IT, not something that is applicable across the board to rest of enterprises. Horse scenario, on the other hand, applicable to all enterprises. We gave them that and then said, if you are filling this gap, Great, we'll wait for it three months, six months, it's not a big deal. If you're not filling that gap within a reasonable time that we need, then we have a conversation. Either we work around this or we fill the gap and make it available. So you'd see a bunch of changes that we have put in the system, a bunch of code that we have put in only to fill gaps. The goal is configure, not code. Protect the integration business. Again, business continuity is the most important thing that we needed to get going with you would see significant amount of effort that we have expended in managing the risk and maintaining it in a way that the business continuity is not impacted at all. Of course, accelerating the move to cloud is very important as well. I could wait for five years until the platform matures completely, and once it is completely mature, my move or migration to the cloud is fairly easy, straightforward. I don't have to worry about doing all these workarounds that we need to do but that's not gonna get us the benefits. I have now put up with five years more of the hardware hell that we were in previously. The intent, again, here is move it as fast as we can with appropriate, play, appropriate breaks that we put in place for keeping ourselves safe from any potential platform risks. And then the last piece out is existing customers cannot get impacted as a mantra that we have. We do not want our existing customers to keep changing every single time that we need to make a change to the platform. That's not acceptable. So the principle there is we'll choose a hand pick, a handful of customers that may have to make some minor changes. A vast majority of our customers should not even know, it should be no opt for them. We had the messages flowing through one platform. Mag automatically tomorrow the messages flow through another platform you are notified because we notify you for compliance reasons or for UAT testing or for any of those uh, purposes that are intended for message flow or risk mitigation. Other than that, you don't need to know. Other than that, it is just a seamless transition. So that is a principle based on which we came up with the design that you would see in the next few slides. So here is where we were as of 2012 when we started. We had a bunch of partners who were coming to Microsoft in various different ways. They were coming either through a van like GXS or directly to Microsoft using various protocols. Some of them used FTP, some of them HTTP, some of them did files. They would just send files over in various different forms. We had an internet gateway that would receive those and then do the firewall traversal to get it into our internal corpnet to our internal gateway. And the internal gateway would then send it over to our internal integration systems. Our internal integration systems were also multifold. It was not a uniform, heterogeneous, you know, homogeneous setup. We had multiple different integration hubs, and we even had Gentran. I say in the past tense because we have just retired Gentran. Uh, good kudos, big kudos to our team that worked on a plan for a good two years to get it out completely out of Gentran 
into Bistock based setup, and we officially retired Gentran out of Microsoft late last month. So nevertheless, then the messages flow through the SAP or uh, line of business applications. The target state architecture that we wanted to get to was we wanted to propel integration directly to the cloud. Four to five years ahead, if I look ahead, this is what we wanted, is how we thought about it back in 2012. And if you see, we wanted to put Microsoft Azure best stock services in the front and center receiving all the messages from all our external business to business partners, then sending it directly to our line of business applications or through the line of business application through the Bistock adapter services strictly for adapter support. So again, the target state architecture that we came up with was not a dreamy one that is not realizable. It's easily realizable as of today with almost exact precision to this architecture that we have in here. Uh, we, we took a phased approach to that, and that's the second part that you would see. So the, the benefits out of this are the key tenets that you get out of this is Azure as the gateway to the internet. Majority processing for EDI happens in the cloud, not on-premises. And integration for Azure workloads is something that we can offer straight on the cloud. They don't need to come on-premise to do the integration. If they need to come to on-premise, its footprint is greatly reduced. We just have one small component, which is the Bistock adapter service. And then the last piece out is we can retire all the legacy solutions. So this is basically what the target state architecture that we came up with was, and the goal or the direction that we are moving. Are we there yet? Do we want to churn the ocean and get all 4,000 streams in one shot? Mm, maybe not. So that's where we have the interim step in between, which is the step which is about one to two years is a window that we set for ourselves. We said in 2012, by end of 2014, this is where we want to be. By end of 2014, what is it that we wanted to achieve? You'd see pretty much all of it, retirement of legacy solutions is something we can achieve. Integration for Azure workloads is something we can achieve. And certainly Azure as a gateway to the internet is something we can achieve. Majority processing in the cloud, yeah, in a different dimension, if you look at it, all EDI processing will happen in the cloud, but a majority of the streams will get processed on-premise. A few of the streams would get processed in the cloud, and over a period of time, we would migrate it out. So again, the click stop that we chose along the way was for us to have a hybrid setup. It might look more complex, it might look like it is double the work, but it is really not. It is more of putting our cloud solution in the front and center and start slowly migrating things to it. You'll see a slightly different view of this that will explain how this coexistence subsume strategy works. But again, the high level goal is take a click stop approach, take a phased approach, let the platform mature over time. As it matures, we'll move things over. Again, this is the setup that we came up with after looking at five, six different options that we had. We have our architect available here as well, so if you have any questions on that, I'd be more than glad to take that during the Q&A session. So moving forward, how did we come about doing this on, in terms of achieving this goal? What is the planning and migration strategy that we use? This is much like mountain climbing if you look at it. You don't start climbing Mount Everest from day one, right? You start with something small. We have a backyard mountain called Mount Sai. Okay, it is 1,000 feet, but 1,000 feet with really steep slope of maybe a 100 foot drop here and there. It's good for us to get our muscles slowly worked up to get over that. So we came up with a pl plan that, come, that brings up this analogy of mountain climbing, pretty much takes it to the core to say, you start with something that is small, then go up to a slightly larger mountain and work your way up Finally, you would reach Everest, but again, it's through multiple stages, multiple phases. So we said the platform by itself should mature over a period of time. The platform by itself will be built over a period of time, and then as and when the platform is ready, we'll move the traffic as appropriate. Again, the reason we had to do this was, again, Maps platform was not ready in 2012 for everything. We had support for X12, Edifact support was coming in later. We had support for blah. We did not have blah and blah available. So there were quite a few mixes that we had to put together 
and that's how we came up with this. The next couple slides will talk about how we took the 4,000 streams that we have, analyzed them, and figured how we would do the message flow migration. But in general, in general, the goal is we do the platform, mature the platform. When the platform is ready, get the traffic onto the platform in small incremental mixes. At the end of the day, when everything is all done, that's when we do the decommission of the legacy systems. We, again, as I said, risk mitigation is number one thing that we do in MSIT. Everything, we're so risk averse that people can get fired for simple little things. If it is simple little thing as one message not coming in, I could get fired. You want to know what that message would be? A hundred million dollar wire transfer. The problem is that one little message for a hundred million dollar wire transfer was the leading message that has a bunch of dependencies behind it. It could be an incoming transfer of hundred million dollars based on which we have hundred different transactions behind it that are outgoing wires of just a million dollars. Just imagine the negative PR that we would run into or real legal liability that we would run into in case any of these messages go down. So from a risk mitigation perspective, our risk tolerance is fairly low, but it is the unmitigated risk that we are talking about here. As long as it is mitigated risk, our appetite for it was okay, was good enough that we could take on the move of lift and shift versus coexistence subsume for this kind of a platform shift or a, a plutonic shift, if you will, in our thinking from moving on premise to cloud. So now let me go into the details on the next set of uh, activities that we had to go for the platform readiness and planning and how we took this mountain climbing approach. The mountain climbing approach is for us to understand what is a big picture view we needed to take stock of everything that we wanted to move to the cloud. So taking stock of everything is very important because the end goal has to lead to that and all the click stops along the way has to accrue to that. So we took the top down approach to say here is our end goal. Then we whittled it down to take phased approach to what we want to achieve in each phase. Each phase was then executed as a separate project so the project had interim milestones along the way as well. Now I can do the design for planned migrations for each project. So if you look at it, the big universe was the 4,000 odd streams, 3,400 odd streams at that time. We call that really the Everest. That was Project Everest. But we are not gonna get to that operational scale of thousands of streams until we get to an operational scale of hundreds of streams and then tens of streams. So that's basically the pivot that we chose, maturity of the platform in its capability to operate at a volume of tens of streams first, hundreds of streams next, thousands of streams later. So the tens of streams project was called Project Rainier, or Backyard Mountain. So we said, okay, let's go climb Rainier, and once we hit the summit of Mount Rainier, that's a good click stop for us to have 100 transactions running totally on the cloud, has nothing to do with our on-premise systems. That's, that's the goal that we set for ourselves for Rainier. That by itself was daunting. Think about it, right? I have 100 business processes that I'm taking from my on-premise systems that's running just fine. I'm not getting anything new out of it. I'm now going to be running on the cloud platform. I'm getting the exact same 100 transactions flowing through. Too much to pay for status quo is how it turned out to be finally. So we said, okay, what are the milestones that we want to put on the interim steps so we can now wrap our heads around, this is what I need to make happen right now and then start executing to it from a project perspective. And that, we broke it down into two extra steps along the way. The two milestones were 10 streams, not tens of streams, 10 streams. And before we got there, one stream. One stream. Getting that one stream online onto the cloud took us almost six months. And why? Operational requirements for that one stream were no less than 10 streams. It was no less than 100 streams. I still needed to have the same compliance needs that I need to meet. I need to do the same tracking needs I need to meet. 
I need to have the same security that I need to have for that one stream as I would for the 10 streams. Maybe the 10 streams might be incrementally bigger, but still the basic requirements I have for all the streams, that one stream got us valuable lessons, innumerable lessons that we could get that our minimum viable product definition was run one stream on the cloud. But that one stream was not one of those unimportant down in the corner kind of streams. It was one of our, uh, from a business impact perspective, low, I would say medium to high, importance perspective, very high. So we just chose something that could potentially come back to haunt us later, but something that would drive the importance of this platform to the businesses. And that's how we started, and that's how we came across. And I can give you, during the implementation, I'll provide you what the streams are and where we are on it right now. So now coming to the big picture view. The big picture view is, again, how did we choose what streams that we wanted to get to? How did we choose important, yet medium to high business impact stream? Something that will get us there with the right visibility and the right sponsorship and exec support. So what we did was we looked at all the streams that we had and analyzed it in three, four different pivots. The first lesson that hit us was when I matched the needs against the platform capabilities, the platform was technically capable of handling anything that we throw at it as far as it was X12, not Edipack, not XML streams that had special requirements. Basic X12, pretty much anything could go. So we looked at it from various different pivots, and the first pivot that we did was, what are the streams, what are the transports, what are the protocols that they use, and X12 with about medium business impact was basically the first set of candidates that we had. And the X12 again came across on various different transports, AS2 or HTTP, we had file protocol, we had WCF, we had a lot of different protocols that it was coming over, and some required orchestrations as well. So we looked at all of these, analyzed it, and said, let's not choose anything that has workflow requirements or orchestration requirements. Let's choose something that is basic X12 transaction that comes on AS2 with medium business impact. The bigger lesson that we learned was Mavs as a platform, the Microsoft Azure BizTalk services as a platform, was capable of, perfectly capable of handling any of the protocol or any of the uh, standards that we were throwing at it. It was the operational level that operational needs, the enterprise level operations where it lacked. And that's the second pivot that we looked at. The second pivot was when I'm operating at a scale of tens of streams, what are my requirements? When I'm operating at a scale of hundreds of streams, what are the requirements? When I'm operating at a scale of thousands of streams, what are the requirements? If you see, it builds on incrementally. The tens of streams is about 40% of it already. We just add a small incremental 25-30% for hundreds of streams and another incremental 25-30% for the thousands of streams case. If I can get to tens of streams, I'm most of the way through. That's, that's the lesson or that's the learning that we had and we chose the top easiest one on X12 and the top tens of streams as the first release, which is the Rainier release. Now, if you see, my scope was not this big universe of 3,500 streams with everything in as requirements, it reduced down to just 100 streams that I'll pick out of this universe of 1,200, and it had only these set of bounded requirements that we could quantify to the product team with 35 requirements across 25 use cases that we could document and put those requirements to the product team to say, you are about 25% done on these requirements. We want you to finish these up before we can go live. It gave them the six month window or the six month headlight that they needed to finish up. It gave us the six month window that we needed to get ready for going live. And when these two met, the first stream went live in September. So that's, that's how we came in. I'll let this sink in for a second. Again, this is very important for you to understand that your requirements and the capabilities that the platform provides needs to have a good match for the initial set of candidates that you take. Okay, so this is the pivot that I was talking about which gives you a better view of 
how we propel integration service into the cloud. So let me give you the target stage topology, not necessarily architecture, topology that we were after. What is listed in green here is what was current as of 2012. We basically had partners coming through either a van like GXS or directly through to our uh, internet-facing gateway in what we call the extranet domain. From the extranet domain, it does all the firewall traversals and brings it over to our internal corporate domain. An internal network that we had had a gateway that receives it, does appropriate processing on it. There could be various different things it could do. All the pieces of the vector pipeline is things that we actually exercised in most of these streams. And we would handle it using files, we would handle it using WCF, we would handle it using all different methodologies or transport mechanisms that you had available. Finally, BizTalk picked it up, did the activity, and sent it over to the line of business application. So across the board, generally, this is the steps in the process where there was significant activity that was happening that had something meaningful that we needed to take and translate into the cloud. So now comes the coexistence part, wherein for the TAP, for the tens of streams, for the 10 streams that we wanted to get, we put in the cloud system on the top. What is listed in the blue on the top is the cloud system which is in running in Azure. We had Azure BizTalk services as the big blue box in the middle in Azure. And then there is a small blue box to the left which is the URL forwarding setup. Remember the risk mitigation that I talked about? That is a risk mitigation step that we put in place. Let's say we go onto the cloud and the Maps team decides, well, I'm giving up on this EDI platform. That's it, I'm not gonna do EDI anymore. That was a real possibility back in 2012, right? It's like we were trying a lot of things on the cloud and we weren't sure whether it will go forward or not. So this is like push the red big button in a gas station, right? In case of emergency, push this red button. That's what that red button was. The URL forwarding was a simple dumb redirector that could send it either to the maps if MAPS is our continuing solution, or send it down to our on-premise system to the gateway, receiving gateway down on-premise. So it just acted as a simple redirector, simple switch that would go between cloud and on-premise systems. It's set up for cloud now. This protection switch is valid and usable for us for a period of time until the deviation between the on-premise implementation and the cloud implementation is not too much. The point that it deviates too much, that switch is unusable. We said a six month window is reasonable enough for us for risk mitigation, and we put that as the first step in the process. The customers that we chose, handpicked two to four customers, had to make one change on their systems. On their production systems, they had to go target to a completely different URL where they sent the messages to. The rest of the customers are still processing on-premise. Everything is happening on the green lines down at the bottom. These hand-picked customers had to make that change. Once they made the change, they had the white line flow on the top where they hit the URL forwarding switch. The switch sent to MAPS, and MAPS processed it. All EDI processing happened in the cloud. We deshelled the AS2 envelope right there. We opened the EDI message, we processed it, converted it into SAP IDOC format, whatever it might be, and sent it down on-premise to our on-premise footprint. If you noticed, our on-premise footprint is not BizTalk adapter services. At this point, it is a full-blown BizTalk server, at this point. Then the BizTalk server sends it down onto LA or LOB systems in whatever form. We chose this for multiple different reasons. We needed archiving support for outbound messages at the point that the system at, at the point the message enters the integration system. If you look at it, the integration system boundary is actually everything in blue, all the way from the stock server on-premise up to the URL forwarding setup in the cloud is the integration system boundary. And archiving was missing at XML Bridge. That's one of the reasons we chose that. There are a bunch of other reasons as well, but nevertheless, right now, it is server. Eventually, the goal is to get to BizTalk adapter services, so it is specialized and lot reduced with just one box on premise, and that's pretty much all we need. And then the message flows go back and forth on this path. So, so far, we have taken the first step in the process, wherein it's again like 
analogy wise, it's like uh, another hometown example I can give is we are replacing a bridge on our lake on Highway 520 with a second more modern bridge. The more modern bridge is built as a coexistent platform with its off-ramp connected first and the on-ramp connected last. Then the message flows or the traffic flows on one direction go on the new bridge and then the second direction is also moved on the new bridge and then the old bridge is demolished. It's very similar to that, that's all we are doing here. It's coexist, get the first set of traffic flowing, platform validated, messages validated, operability confirmed, and then we would see the next step. The next step would be for us to change the DNS entry for our current receiving platform, our current receiving endpoint to point to our URL setup. So now the TAP partners had to make the change the rest of the partners don't have to do a thing. They kept sending messages to ebus.one.microsoft.com, whatever the URL was, they still keep sending to the same URL. But now the message previously was going through our on-premise infrastructure, it now goes through our cloud infrastructure. Are we ready for handling all 4,000 streams now? No, we are not. So we needed to have the intelligence in the cloud to say this stream has been moved into the cloud so I will send it straight through for processing in the cloud, or it has not been moved, I need to send it back to the on-premise infrastructure. So that is the step B, wherein you see that the message is sent to the on-premise infrastructure. Over a period of time, we'll keep moving all these streams from our on-premise to the cloud infrastructure. That is the yellow line that you see, yellow stream that you see from MABS. In AS2, we make the determination whether it continues on in MABS or it goes down to the on-premise. When all the streams are moved, you'd see that there is no traffic flowing through what is marked as C. All the traffic is flowing through the yellow, the orange line going up through B, and then the yellow line going through the maps, coming down to our bus stop server and getting down to our LOB systems. Again, over a long period of time, I'm talking three years. Internet time, it is really long period of time. So three years. Our goal is to move all of these platform components or platform streams that we have on the on-premise systems up to the cloud, and then the next step out is the retirement of the legacy platform. If you see, we did the coexistence subsume over a period of time in a phased manner with absolutely no impact to the customer or to our external partner with all of it managed on our platform boundaries with full business continuity ensured for the customer to close. This is basically what our uh, long-term thinking or long-term solution would be. So coming on to the stream migration, I'll take just about five minutes to finish up the rest of it. Coming on to the stream migration, here again, Microsoft being Microsoft, we took, again, a platform approach. We took a product approach or a tools approach. We took the long-term direction to say, let us classify the streams and figure out how we can move this efficiently over a period of time. For me to get to tens of streams, it's easy. We could handcraft the transforms that are needed or move the maps from BizTalk server 2013 to BizTalk on the cloud. Easy enough to do, 10 streams, yeah. Tens of streams, well, who is going to write the 100 transforms? Hundreds of streams, okay, 1,000 streams in a year is approximately three streams a day. Three streams a day have to go live on a daily basis for us to get to 1,000 streams in a year. Thousands of streams, okay, you are talking 10, 15 streams in a day. So there is no way we could do any of this handcrafted stuff, so we had to go through a whole bunch of automation in place. And what do we intend to do and how do we plan to achieve it? This is what this slide talks about. We have an analysis factory option wherein we analyze all the streams that we have for various different classifications that we have across multiple different dimensions that are listed out here. And then we figure the migration options that we want. The migration options or the candidates would be chosen based on the needs that they have and we continuously keep updating the backlog for the platform on AIS side as well as on the MAP side. Once we have all of those in place, we can now leverage the factory model, wherein we can have continuous map development for migrations, 
and by investing in tools for automatic conversion of Bistock trading partner agreements to MAPS trading partner agreements. Bistock MAPS to MAPS transforms. We now intend to, we now have the ability to get to a point where we could efficiently move in a factory model all 4,000 streams as of today, 3,400 streams that we had at the time that we came up with this plan. Again, over a period of time, the migration automation should also be enabled as a tool, maturing over a period of time to get the self-serve capability. So a customer can choose, this is when we, or our onboarding team can choose for this entire business unit, let us move all the streams over in one shot. So again, you could take various different approaches. This is the approach we chose. I'm not telling this the only way to do it. This is a way to do it. And this, these were the factors or considerations that we had to have for it. For greenfield approach, supplier readiness is all that is important. With the supplier readiness, you could just start a brand new stream and you should be able to get going really fast. Coming to the implementation, the current status, uh, I'll give you a little bit on where we are and where we will be by the end of this year. And of course, the role of MAPS and on-premise BizTalk servers, what work that we had to do specifically, and what are the operability concerns or considerations that we had. So the current status is, as I said, we took the approach to saying we want to get to one stream online first, tens of streams next, uh, 10 streams next, and then tens of streams by the end of this year end of this fiscal year, that's our goal. So now from a platform perspective, the platform by itself was tested with a bunch of test maps and ready to go. And once we put in this one stream in production use, that was around September, the DR plan for that was, well, premature. We just said, if there is any problem, we'll revert back to the on-premise for DR. Is that a solution we can live with for long term? No. For 10 streams, well, maybe we can. So we said, okay, fine, by the end of this, year, when we say the platform is complete for taking the tens of streams, we need to have a complete DR story. So that's the phased approach that you'll see, an example of the phased approach that you'll see in how the platform matures over a period of time. So right now, we are at the point where we are done with that one stream online. We also went ahead and modified that stream so that we get our experience doing the regular change control process that we have for it by adding on a second partner on the same map. And of course, we are now ready. I put a gray check mark there because today is the end of the sprint for us, wherein we are platform complete, and we are ready to say we can take 10 streams online. The actual traffic flow will be changed sometime in early January, but the platform should be ready by end of day today. And that's the 10 streams in production tap. And the next step out is the platform is ready for tens of streams. The migration based on the business windows will happen during the January to June timeframe, by the end of June, we should really have 100 streams online. Again, we'll artificially cap it off at 100. We are capable of taking a lot more because the platform would keep evolving along the time as well. So this is where we are as of today, and there have been quite a few lessons learned. I'll cover that in the next couple slides. So the first one is hybrid is a current reality, and that's not gonna change Pretty much all enterprises will take a similar approach as well. They would want to maintain business continuity. They would want to maintain their existing systems, get the traffic flowing without impacting business in any sense as how pretty much all non-enterprises, enterprises as well as other businesses would look at it. So if you look at it, what is the role of MAPS and what is the role of MAPS being the Azure BizTalk services in cloud versus the on-premise BizTalk server? or on-premise BizTalk adapter services. The on-premise BizTalk adapter services is really, really reduced in terms of its capability, in terms of its use as to what we use for. It's for connectivity to existing systems. It's a store and forward mechanism for archiving and for tracking. And it's a fallback environment because it is fully capable of connecting and coming online at a short notice. Other than that, we don't use any capabilities of this talk. It is just something that has a receive location and the send port, get something on one side and puts onto the other side. That's pretty much it. All the processing happens in the cloud. This is again very important for us to have the end state in mind so that you can design your systems to say, 
all the processing happens in cloud. When I have the Bistock server removed and adapter services in place, I don't have to go and redo any work. That is the important part. So we, we set it up in such a way that all error handling, EDI processing, transformations, everything happens in the cloud, and just the routing happens on the Bistock server. So what work did we do as MSIT, Microsoft IT, on top of the Azure Bistock platform? The Azure Bistock platform by itself provides fantastic capabilities for message processing. So if I put an X12 message in there, handling that message is something that Bistock is very good at. What we had to do was for us to say, this is the transformation that needs to happen, so create the transform for that message to do the transformation. We had to port the trading partner agreements because remember this, none of this is just new streams coming on board. It's all existing business processes that we are handling today on our on-prem platform. So I cannot go to the customer and tell them, do something new for me. I had to take and work with what was already there and adapt it into the cloud or push this into the cloud. So we had to port the agreements in place. We had to validate and implement compliance controls, security and compliance at Microsoft probably is a super set of most enterprises. We have pretty much all kinds of transactions going across supply chain. You saw the initial list, right? So we have Xbox, Kinect, hardware manufacturing, software manufacturing, logistics, all, the, uh, all of it has its own financials, all of it has its own compliance controls. We actually pushed a bunch of compliance requirements on the platform, so the platform would be compliance ready for most enterprises the horse scenarios would be covered. The unicorn scenarios is all we need to cover. For Microsoft IT, I had to put in specific controls in place. For your company, if you are uh, any enterprise customer like Macy's or Shell or uh, Chevron, any of the companies that are out there that need to have your own controls in place, that's a small incremental add-on on top of the base compliance that you get. And of course, the last part out is the tools for the operational scale. You'd see a demo of this uh, for tracking, resubmission, and alerting. There were quite a few gaps that we had found in the product. The product by itself was intended for high volume transactional support for X12 transactions, not operating at high volume from an operational support. Again, the distinction there is very important. From an enterprise perspective, we are married to SCOM. We were looking at it from a SCOM perspective but the Mavs as a platform was not. So there were some gaps that we had to bridge there and you would see in the demo how the tracking, resubmission, and other pieces were. The, the experience managing this platform for enterprise scale was what we had to put in significant effort. So the next slide details out uh, the operability related pieces that we put in there. For example, for you to add a new scaler to a scale unit to a new subscription or an existing subscription, what is the work that we need to do? The process that needs to be in place. It's mostly on process and when to trigger the process and when what happens. DR, there are multiple data centers supported in Azure, but MAPS as a single uh, unit, if you look at it, it can have additional units that you can add, but it has to be in the same geo. I cannot have across multiple geos. So for DR, I had to do something different. It's more of an active passive setup that we have but the value of that is very high for MSIT. So we had to go through that step to come up with what the DR strategy would be for us. Tracking is critical at each milestone. When a message passes through the entire system, they ask, okay, what are the steps in the process that it has completed and where has it failed? And this is how we do troubleshooting at Microsoft. Our business units don't have exact control of the data that is being sent from their customers or their partners they only have control after it hits their system. So they are forced to work with this as it is as of that point. It's important for us to take a snapshot and provide it to our business so they can do the troubleshooting and then contact the customer to say, your system upgrade resulted in blah change that has caused this failure, so you need to go fix that on your side. And of course, the last part out is the alerting. The alerting mechanisms that we have in place today in MAPS is all cloud-based but we had to work with our existing SCOM environment. And that's the last part. We had to put in a lot of custom alerts based on the scripts within SCOM. So these are the changes that we have built on top of MAPS 
So if you look at the layering, Azure is the underpinning for all of Azure Bistock services. Azure Bistock services is a layer that is built on top of Azure. So that's the pass layer. On top of that is where our Azure integration service offering layer comes within Microsoft IT. And then customers plug in on top of this. So that's how this works. And now to the demo. I think I've talked for a good 45 minutes now. We'll probably take about five minutes for doing a demo for what the alerting, the tracking tool, and the resubmission tool does. And then I'll take five more minutes for summarizing the challenges that we have faced, how the product is better for it, and then we'll close the session with Q&A. Go ahead, uh, now I invite uh, Padma to do the demo on alerting and tracking tool. There are two scenarios that we would show. Go ahead and sit down. There are two scenarios that we would so show. The first scenario is the happy path scenario. There is one message that is being sent from a partner to Microsoft or Microsoft to partner. And what does it take for you to say, this message passed through these phases and landed at the customer at this point? The second part is the not happy path scenario, wherein something failed and what happens in that failure. So, go ahead, Padma. Hey, uh, this is Padma. I'm here to help with the demo piece of it. Uh, as Kanan mentioned, uh, we have uh, simulated, uh, we have the external partner sending the messages to maps, and then uh, the message in turn is flows to the Microsoft internal lines of business. And in between, we have the BizTalk 2013 machine. Okay, so here this machine is the cloud machine which we um, simulated with the external trading partner who is sending the messages to maps, and this machine is our uh, Bistock 2013 machine, which is sitting in the on-premise uh, in the Microsoft CorpNet, which is connected to internal lines of business. Now I'm going to uh, show you a demo where uh, external partner is sending one 850 file or purchase order to Microsoft, and which is coming to maps first, and then which is internally going to the uh, lines of uh, business. So let me add a couple of lines in here. So you'd see that she dropped the file in there and it just disappeared within a second. That's basically our uh, demo of telling a message was dropped at a received location. And the cloudapp.net on the top is the one that will tell you that's the customer side. The customer has sent that message to Microsoft at this point. That's basically what it is. And on the internal side, you'd see the, uh, the top window showing the server name, CO1 blah blah V93. And that's our internal machine. So now you can see the message has uh, come to maps. And these are all the different bridges as uh, Kandan has shown his uh, presentation, like XML bridge, EDI bridge, and then AS2 bridges. Uh, I'm going to take the request ID from here. The intent of uh, the tracking tool we are providing uh, for operational purpose is to, uh, this tracking portal is not giving the clear picture whether, whether the message has come, whether the 997 has sent back or MDN has sent back. So in order to collate all the details in one place, we have, continue. We have provided a tracking tool to operations team in order to get all these details at one place. And this is one single message I dropped and we can see uh, perfectly like here yeah, message has come and this is the timeline. But in the real production scenario, uh, partners will send the uh, bunches of mails or bunches of messages, and then the tracking of those uh, incoming messages are really difficult for the operations team to do it. That's right. So we are taking this request ID, and we would show how it matches. For me to understand whether the message has passed through all the different phases and a customer has acknowledged it back, I have to go to the tracking portal, get the message ID from one place, get the information on the message flow within maps, and then the second part, I have to go to a different location to see if I have received an MDN. I have no idea whether my on-premise systems process these. So it's all disparate information in multiple different places. The consolidation is what the tracking tool does, as Padma will show you now. Yeah, so... Uh, <laughs> Certainly, yeah, let's fix the resolution. Hmm? 
Does that help, or do you think we need to really reduce the resolution as such? <laughs> okay, so you, you go ahead and color, talk. I that. think. Did that help? Okay. Yeah. You keep talking about it. I'll fix the resolution. Okay. So uh, the first thing is the maps is to bridge receive. That is a milestone which is showing. And then there's the pass through bridge between the AS2 and the EDI bridge. Next is the EDI bridge. And this is the place we send that functional act back to partners. And then the next milestone is the MDN, which is sent back to the partners. and. Uh, uh, this is the EDI bridge, which is the, the VGA EDI bridge milestone, and this is the XML bridge between the EDI and AS2 bridges. And the last milestones are the BSTOC receive and BSTOC server send is that on-premise uh, BSTOC 13 machine, 2013 machine, where we receive the messages. And from there, the message is flowing back to the Microsoft internal lines of business. Okay, let me try reducing the resolution, and uh, if it bombs out, then sorry, can't help it. Okay, now go ahead. <laughs> That's even worse now. <laughs> okay, we'll revert back. So you, you go ahead, please, yeah. So again, as you can see, uh, the message flow across all the milestones, all the way from our on-premise BizTalk server to the point that the message reached the partner and we got an MDN back or we sent an MDN. It's all recorded in one place in the tool. Currently, it's a command line tool. As I said, sorry, as I said, this will evolve or mature over a period of time. Eventually, we'll get to a full-blown UI on it and the tracking portal and so on. But right now, it is just a command line tool that gets you all this information at this point. So right now, I have a problem to look at this. Okay, we are uh, reverting back the resolution to what it was before so that at least we use the full I keep changing. We use the full real estate of the screen. Okay. Now so this looks much better, right? <laughs> And then uh, other uh, thing is not only with the request ID, we have the different uh, uh, options to like you know query the whatever the messages come. Uh, this is one thing like you know using the control number when uh, what the message has come and then we can go ahead and look for whether the control number or the particular specific message has reached or not. And then if you want, you can upload it to the .csv file too. This is one of the common operational scenarios that we have. It's not based on the request ID. It is based on something that's a logical value in the transaction. It could be a purchase order number, it could be a control number, it could be something that is a field in the transaction, not necessarily the request ID based on the metadata of the transaction. So that's one of the things that we do. And of course, we have the ability to export it into a CSV file. And once we export it out, you have full processing of Excel behind it. Yeah, this is the way it shows. So this is the Excel file that we just showed. And now we are moving on to the second part of the demo, which is the not so happy path scenario. And to simulate the not so happy path scenario, what we would do is we'll take, uh, is that an inbound transaction? It's an outbound okay. transaction. Outbound? Yeah. Okay, so we are doing an outbound transaction uh, that we are going to be sending a message from Microsoft to an external partner. Because it's a simulated environment in our test environment, the external partner, VM, is where we will go and shut down the AS2 receive endpoint, which means our send will work all the way up to the AS2 bridge. The AS2 bridge will try to post a message on to the external partner, and the external partner is not ready to receive it, not available to receive it. And in that case, we would report an error, and the error would say, I'm not able to reach the AS2 endpoint. 
But EDI processing and everything was successful, so the EDI bridge actually does a suspension of this and puts the message into a suspense store. That's the scenario that you would see. And then the resubmission story is what we have augmented, I'll explain in a second. So this is the outbound file we ju I just submitted, and then it failed at the EDI, saying that you know endpoint is not available. So the AS2 message sender is the one that says the endpoint is not available, and then it says I have now suspended the transaction. When you suspend the transaction, if it is one transaction, one message here and there, an operator can go look at that transaction and then say, well, I can resume that transaction or resubmit the transaction. But in an enterprise scenario, that is not a scalable way to do or not a sustainable way to operate. So what we have done is we have written a resubmission tool that will go and query or look into this suspend store that we have configured. It's a blob store. And if there are messages to process for specific types of errors, for example, connectivity errors, it's resumable, retriable errors. If it is some logic processing error, we wouldn't do it. But for specific conditions under which we can do a retry, we'll automatically resubmit this message, and that resubmission tool will try this for a configured times, n number of times, with an interval of x. And at the end of that, it'll report an error telling that I tried three times, 60 seconds apart, it failed. You now need to have operator intervention to take a look at this to see what is happening. So that's the scenario that uh, the demo would show. Yeah, so uh, the message suspended, and the first time it retried. If you look at this, this message is having the request ID uh, D4, and you can see the same request ID in the blob storage. This is the blob storage which I just pulled out. Uh, the same message is failed and went into the, suspended and went into the blob storage. And our auto resubmission is trying to resubmit continuously and which is configurable again, like, so here you can see the resubmission path. In one more minute you can see the couple of resubmissions and then it will finally fail and say like, no, I elapsed with all the resubmission trials and then it's still in the suspend store. Later we can go ahead and then take the message ID from the blob store and manually resubmit it. Of course, by enabling the endpoint, so it will go successfully to the partner machine. So do you want to enable the endpoint right now? And no, we can see uh, suspend completely, and then okay. like you know, we can do the manual. Okay, so our setup in our test environment, it is set up for retry two times, 60 seconds apart. The default that we will have will be a lot more than that. It will be uh, three or five times for 10 minutes apart. Typically, the AS2 servers going down goes down for half an hour to an hour max. So we would like to keep our intervals appropriately set up in such a way that the automatic retry is the first catch bucket for us. And we want to catch 90% of resubmissions to be done right there, taken care of, 99% taken care of, and have just 1% of it that the retries fail that our operations team needs to look at. Otherwise, it's not a sustainable way to operate. So first time when the message suspend, you can there is no retry count is captured here in the blob storage. If I go and refresh it, you can see that retry count. So this is the retry count, is the processing token and retry count has two, and then there's a new request ID which is generated, and the original request ID is uh, nine zero. That's another important point. Each time we attempt to resubmit, it gets a new request ID. And this is again something that becomes a tracking nightmare. Our tracking tool takes care of all of these and kind of uh, rationalizes all of this by putting in one abstraction point we call AIS request ID. And that ID is carried forward throughout the system regardless of the number of retries or regardless of the number of steps in the process. So that's another important thing that we capture here so that you can see the messages are flowing through and now my tracking tool will have a couple of extra milestones that it will show. I retried once, it failed. I retried twice, it failed. And on the third attempt, it succeeded. Tracking milestones. So as you can see, the request ID is the one that we got from the first attempt, and we are posting it in here to get the status for from the tracking tool for the various milestones that it has gone through right now. And right now, you'd see that it has failed. It has tried first time, failed, 
then it tried, retried twice and it failed. And you'd see the error messages showing up there as well. And the status is faltered, basically means that it's not able to send it. There are three attempts that it has done. The first attempt is the original message that it tried. The two retries are listed here and then it has failed. And the last part out is now we'll enable that receive endpoint and then we'll resubmit manually and the resubmit manually should work fine. It gets a brand new request ID for that as well. And now if we go back to the tracking tool, you would now see that it attempted twice, failed. I manually resubmitted and the message passed. Now the business that is receiving this message would now know exactly the sequence of steps that happened and at what time, what date, what activity occurred or when it was delivered to the customer. So this time the manual resubmission succeeded? And then we can see the successful milestone for that particular request ID. Okay, while this is processing, can you go to the tracking portal, Padma, and show that the success has been logged on the tracking portal? And then that's the first indicator, and then the tracking tool. Yeah. By the way, the tracking tool actually does a distributed query across cloud and our on-premise systems and pulls this information. So it takes a while to execute, and you can see that the route is now successful. And the tracking tool will also show now the last yeah. completed. This will show how many times that uh, it failed or it retried at the AS2 bridges, like two times. It is the first time it failed, and two times it tried to retry. And then this is a successful final, successful completion. And then where we receive that. And then there is also a functional acknowledgement that has been received. MDN has been received for the transaction is listed right here. So that's pretty much all that we have for the demo today. Uh, one more last piece. Yeah. Um, the, the SCOM piece, like which Kanan was telling, if something fails on the bridges, it is, uh, uh, there is an alert in the SCOM, and uh, internally it will send an email to the operations team saying that, hey, something is failed, uh, some processing is failed in the different bridges, and then it will give the exactly what is that message and then what is the request ID, all the details. Again, this is an email notification that is configurable. You could set it up for any kind of configured uh, email addresses to which it can be sent. And here is an example. This is from the current failure that we just had. This is the notification that was sent out. 